So again, welcome to Nova Scribes. This is the Visual Models of Leadership. Um, I'm Brian Tarallo. I'm going to be one of your co-hosts tonight, along with Matteo Becky, Rachel Thompson, and Nevada Lane. And if I can ask the three of you just to do a quick introduction. In that order. Hi, I'm Matteo Becky. Over to you, Rachel. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rachel Thompson, one of the co-organizers and um, from Daring Studios. Nevada? Uh, thanks, guys. Hi, everybody. Nevada Lane, based in San Francisco, not too far from Lori, and facilitator, coach, and have a background in OD. Great to be here. Thanks for that. I'm also going to share my screen just so we've got something a little bit more interesting uh, for the, the video other than um, our faces. And if you're viewing this on your own version of uh, Mural, just make sure you're not clicking on my shared screen. Um, so what got us here is that, you know, Mateo and Rachel and I, uh, we're big fans of leadership development models, and uh, we had it in our heads that we wanted to do something like this. And as we were designing it, I was, you know, wasting my time on Instagram, and I happened to notice that that Nevada was dropping leadership development models onto Instagram and LinkedIn. I said, hey, would you like to be a part of this? And so she leaned into it. That quote down at the bottom of the start here is hers. All models are wrong, but sometimes useful. Well, you, you know, you quoted George Box, but there you go. So our outcome, we're going to kick off using um, actually a Grove tool. Uh, this is the meeting startup. So our outcome for tonight is to learn and practice using models of leadership that can be expressed visually. So there's tons of different leadership models that we did not include just because they don't have a visual component behind it. So these are the ones, again, that there is a visual framework that you can point to. So a couple of agreements, please be prepared to participate. Um, keep yourself on mute unless you want to speak. In fact, we will keep an eye on the participant window. And if we see you go off mute, we'll take that as a sign that you've got to say something. For example, Casey, no, just kidding. All right, so like, like that. So we'll keep an eye on the mute uh, button. And if you go off mute, we'll, we'll take that as a sign that you want to say something. So again, we're recording this and we will share the video and a copy of this mural on the Meetups event page um, uh, in the comment section, okay? And then to that point, please make requests through this. So this is kind of loose. We wanted to set this up as like a gallery walk um, so that you could peruse and choose the ones that you really want to focus on. And that's where we'll go. Um, a couple of the roles tonight. So please ask questions, participate in the activities, and then share your knowledge. I'm sure you all have got some leadership models that are not here. There's space in the gallery. We will make space in the gallery um, so that we can include any models that you'd like to, you'd like to add to this. And again, your facilitators tonight, are Nevada, Mateo, Rachel, and myself. So we are gonna kick off with a check-in. And so, whoops, let me pull everybody over here. Um, Rachel, can I ask you to do the check-in? Would you be all right with that? Sure. Um, so in this check-in, so in the mural, I would claim a gray circle and put your name in it. Make sure you don't type over someone else's, you want to have everyone have their own gray circle. And then in the blue circle, just write maybe a word or phrase about how you're feeling about the month of May. Um, professionally, personally, randomly, um, kind of can take that prompt in whichever way you'd like to do. Let's see, Brian is variation in temperatures. <laughs> Tiff is what? Warm and sunny, enlightened, radically resilient. I really like that. I don't know what that means, but I like it a lot. <laughs> enlightened, not summer, not summer. <laughs> Yay, sunlight though. Hungry and energized. Warm and sunny, optimistic. Someone's drawing flowers. I like it. Creative breakthrough. I like that people are just adding flowers and visuals and icons and really taking it and making it, making it theirs. With this crowd, I expect nothing less, right, Rachel? Yeah, that's, that's, that's very true. Mm -hmm. Um, would anybody like to take, let me get maybe one or two people, if you'd like to share, Anything about how you're feeling about the month of May? Or not, just an invitation. Feel free to go off mute for that. How are you feeling about the month of May?
I think they want to jump into it. Should we jump into okay. it? Okay, yeah, no, let's do that. Oh, wait, Lori had one. I saw that, Lori. You're up. Great. I was just going to say, when I lived in Boston uh, and I arrived in the fall, everybody in the in the summer, it was really, really hot. And the fall arrived and I was like, it's fall. It's wonderful. The trees, everything. I went, winter's coming. And then we went through winter, which was winter in Boston. And then the spring hit and we were coming into May. And I was like, spring is here and everyone said summer's coming so i really appreciated having a beginner's mind and that's why i moved back to california <laughs> nice thank you for that lori thank you for sharing so i'm gonna i'm gonna grab everybody's uh everybody's screen um just because i want to orient you to just two models before i turn you loose and have you walk through this okay um, so I'm going to scan over to, to these two. So you should see uh, two of them. One of them is a lens on human behavior. And then the other one got, goes self-team and organization. And I think that these two can be used to think about uh, leadership models as a whole. So the first is that the, the way that I like to talk about any leadership model is that it is simply a lens in order to understand human behavior. Um, it is something that we can use in order to diagnose and in some instances actually prescribe that very messy, ambiguous, um, uncertain thing, which is the way that people actually behave towards one another. And so if we use a leadership model, um, it, I think the best use of it is to diagnose and figure out, okay, this is some weird stuff that's happening in an organization, in a team, even in myself, what might be going on there? Um, and any one of these as a different lens will give you a different perspective. So something is going to look different from the lens of the Myers-Briggs. Something is going to look different from the lens of the Thomas Kilman conflict indicator. Okay. And depending on the lens you use, you'll get a different view. And hopefully if you use a lot of them, then you just get the whole picture. Uh, the other one is the idea of self-team and organization. This is called actualization. I couldn't find the, the source for this one. Um, but another way you could think about leadership models is that leadership exists at all levels. There's individual leadership. There's leadership as a team. Um, a, a team tool that you'll see in here is the um, Drexler Civet model for team performance. So that's one to take a look at. And then uh, there's leadership models that exist at an organization or a cultural level. And one that I'd steer you to is the OCAI, the Organization Culture Assessment Indicator. Um, and that, that could be another organizing construct for the way that you actually think about these different leadership models. Building leadership in self, self-awareness, emotional intelligence, building leadership as a team or as a group, and then finally pushing that out to the organization. So how we're gonna do this is, let me pull you back over to the agenda. Um, now that we've gotten through our, uh, our check-in and oriented you to uh, what we've got, let me talk about how we're gonna get there. So for the next few minutes, we want you to do a gallery walk. This is gonna be, it, it, it doesn't have to be a silent thing. We want you to scan through what's here and make a mental note of the models that interest you, okay? Um, then what we're going to do is using Mural, we're going to have you do a dot vote um, around the models that you have a lot of energy around. And then depending on which one of the four of us drop that model in, uh, we are going to drop into the role of, uh, of museum docent and we'll take you through that model. We'll explain it. If there's a modality behind it, we may actually have you walk through the model and actually practice it. And that's where we'll kick off what we're calling our tour of visual models of leadership. And yeah, Lauren, it's kind of a variation on an open space, okay? Um, Mateo, Rachel, Nevada, did I forget anything before I turn them loose to do the gallery walk? Anything else? I think that's great. I think we were we were joking before we jumped on that we have a potpourri of models. So they're organized, uh, they're, they're in the board in no particular order. So you'll see they go, sometimes there's a self-leadership model, there's one that's a more team model, more organizational, spread around. So it's more of a um potpourri of models to explore okay i'm going to pause the recording just for the gallery walk once we kick off the actual uh the tour i'll get it started again I'll also stop sharing my screen again this doesn't have to be a silent gallery walk if anybody's got a question that's what we're here for but otherwise the time is yours we'll give you just a few minutes and pulse check you you know once it looks like you're we're ready to go with the vote we'll kick it off have fun
Okay, so welcome, welcome back everybody. Thank you very much for your votes. So the votes are in and it looks like the first one is the OCAI. Let me go ahead and pull you over here to start with this one. I'm really, really excited that this one came out on top um, because this is one of my favorite models. There's a ton of leadership development models out there. This one is unique because this one is actually for an organization. And so what you do is, uh, well, first of all, it's based on what's called the competing values framework, mm -hmm. which is work that was pulled together by Cameron Quinn, uh, Kim Cameron, sorry, and Robert Quinn. Um, the book, The Competing Values, is definitely worth a read. And what it says is that there is no one single culture, that if you're familiar with polarities, there are polarities that a culture and an organization grapples with. And so if you take a look at the axes in between the beach ball there, there's the axis of being more flexible or focused. And again, no organization is all or nothing, right? But it's like, where do you stand on that gradient? And then there's the axis of internal or external focused. Are we more internally focused towards our own policies, procedures, uh, 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 process improvement, continuous improvement, Six Sigma, that kind of thing, or more externally focused? Are we uh, focused on our customers or the industry or our competitors or our suppliers? And so what you do is there's actually an assessment that goes with it. Um, and the, the result of one of the assessments is what you're looking at in the center there. So you have individuals take this assessment and then they come in, they compare their scores, which is the, the photograph that you see on the right. They compare mm -hmm. their scores and they do an as is and a to be. So if you take a look at that, the center one, that's INSCOM, which is to say the Army Intelligence and Security Command when they ran through this. The solid line is them as a hierarchy. So they say we're really hierarchical. And the dotted line represents where they want to be, which is a little bit more evenly balanced. So easing up on the hierarchy, letting go of that just a little bit, and adopting um, you know, a more balanced view of things. Mm -hmm. And so the four quadrants that you mm -hmm. fall into is, first of all, there's a hierarchy, which is in the lower left-hand hand corner. This is all about control. Um, then there's being market driven. That's in the lower right. So this is about doing things fast, being um, uh, getting out there and, and, and responding mm. quickly. OK, so think of these folks as more firefighters than anything else. Um, fast to follow. Then there's an adhocracy, which is the upper right hand corner. This is about doing things first, being the first ones to market, being creative. Um, and then in the upper left hand corner, there's what they call the clan, which is doing things together, being more collaborative. Um, I will tell you just because of like the, the the association of the word clan, sometimes when I do this, I use the metaphor of a family rather than that word. Okay, it tends to fall a little bit better. The thing that I really like about this model is that not only can you look at as is and to be culture, but there's also an overlay of the Myers-Briggs temperaments. And so if you know your Myers-Briggs type, that can really do some revealing to say, okay, why is it that I, I haven't had such a great fit in this organization? You know, if I'm an NT and what's most important to me is to do things first and to it, constantly improve things, and I try to join um, an organization that cares about doing things together that's more clannish, right, there's going to be a culture shock that's there. Okay? So that is, the, that is the rapid overview of the OCI. It's a, it's a really great tool. Um, I have the assessment. I'd be happy to share it with you. What are your questions before we go into the next one? Yeah, Casey, what do you got? Uh, what was what was the name of the book again? Uh, it's called the Competing Values Framework, or just Competing Values, by Cameron and Quinn. So, is the um, assessment in public domain, or is there a cost when you take it? Um, I found one that was in a public domain, and I just have been using that one. Okay, I'd love to see that. Thanks, Brian. I'll see what I can do. Mm -hmm. There's kind of a nice tie in between this one, or there's an interesting Venn diagram here with the Kinevin model. Hmm. You want to around, do that one next? Well, sure. And not, it's not my specialty, but I'm just noticing there's something here around fit with the external environment, right? So if you think about the army, like hierarchy and control doesn't work well in a complex environment, right? So there's sort of an organizational system or organizational ecosystem fit issue here that's sort of interesting to think about yeah um in chat it looks like uh lauren was asking about the diagram on the right do you mean the one that they're working on uh the photograph or because the um lauren go ahead yes 
Okay, so what was happening there is that they they this was this actually happened to be for a bunch of rocket scientists, and so what they wanted to do is what you traditionally do is you take um, sorry about that you take the uh, the results of the uh, the assessment which are those double diamonds right there, and you have folks talk to each other and come to a uh, an agreement on what they think the as is to the two be. These rocket scientists they didn't want to do that, so what they did is that they plotted their own individual vectors of where they were versus where they wanted to be and then compared the overall kind of like i don't know um uh uh, uh gulf stream of you know direction that they had because you know they're rocket scientists that's, that's not the way to do it though it's just it was pretty cool that's, <laughs> that's amazing awesome. so did they did it come out of an assessment or they just kind of looked at it and said well we want to pull slightly this way that came out of an assessment, which okay. I'm about to drop into into chat for whoever wants it. <laughs> okay. um, I think the next one, Rachel, is yours actually with radical candor. You want to do that one? Yes, I can talk about radical candor. Um, so I'm gonna go over to where we are. Okay, I'm gonna. Can I summon people? Must be followed. So this is maybe not quite a leadership model, but it's kind of, it's more of a feedback model. It is uh, from a book and the work of Kim Scott called Radical Candor. And um, there's the two axes, which is the care personally, which I think she calls the give a damn, the give a damn um, axis. And then the challenge directly, which is the being willing to piss people off. And this graphic is something I made um, from my notes of the book. So um, often usually you'll just see the two axes and then the radical candor, obnoxious, aggression, manipulative, insincerity, and ruinous empathy. Um, and her book usually, it really uses a context of a boss giving feedback to um, their subordinates. And then as an example for like what each, like within each quadrant, I like her example of um, like, if you have food in your teeth, um, ruinous empathy is a, someone like caring personally, but not being willing to challenge directly. So they won't tell you cause they don't want to hurt your feelings. And I think she was saying that most people tend to kind of um, and this is not, this is not really a place to do, but like eat, we all kind of end up in all the places, but a lot of um, our feedback is usually in the ruinous empathy where, you know, we don't want to really say, hey, you have food in your teeth. Um, the obnoxious aggression is kind of the, um, the asshole quadrant, I would say, is maybe a way to talk about it. And that might be, that might look like, you know, if you have food in your teeth and saying, you know, me yelling across the room, hey, you have food in your teeth in front of people, you know, it's embarrassing that thing. It's not, it might be helpful, but it's not particularly um, like nice. It's not particularly kind. Um, and the manipulative insincerity is one where, you know, you really, you don't just, it, it's quiet, like ruinous empathy, but it's also just, there's just no caring. And then I like this, you know, here, this be professional at the bottom is, because usually that's where, you know, a lot of cultures sometimes might be like, oh, being professional means not caring personally. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. But radical candor is the one that is, I guess, the most productive or constructive. And that's where you can get really the growth and profound change. Um, and I would like that, that the way that that looks like is if you know if you have food in your teeth or something like that, then you know, pulling someone aside and saying, hey, you have food in your teeth quietly, you know, as immediately as you can. It's very specific and sincere, it's kind and clear. And it's something that like, you know, is very actionable. Um, and then these arrows, like, you know, if you, um, uh, people often, you know, obnoxious aggression is actually usually um, not better, but maybe people don't mind it as much as ruinous empathy, because you actually get the feedback, but it like, you know, especially over time, if someone is giving feedback continuously um, without giving a damn, then it just gets really, you know, kind of leads to the underlying just defensiveness and, and little changes. And so, you know, here you can see like the different ways to move more towards radical candor. Um, 
Any thoughts or questions or? I love the distinguishing between nice and kind. That's really, it's really good. Uh, what comes up for me as I, as I look at the model and because I only haven't read the book, but uh, is what's the impact, right? So the person could say, I give a damn and I'm challenging directly and say mm -hmm. it's radical candor. How does the person experience that? Right? Is there is there the trust built up that they feel like the person gives a damn, uh, so that they are willing to hear the direct challenge as kind and clear? Yeah. No, I think, and I like, I really like that difference between kind because she was saying it's not mean, it's it's kind, like because it's not necessarily nice. You're not like being polite because that really can, if you're trying to be polite about it, that might push you more into your empathy. And like, you know, one example she has is, you know, so she was, I think her boss was Cheryl Sandberg back in the day and Cheryl Sandberg gave her, you know, very specific and sincere people saying she was saying um a lot, which I also tend to do that sometimes and I'm working on it. Um, and she, Cheryl Sandberg was like, that makes you sound this way. So it was kind of, it could have been perceived as mean you know, that's where you like, that's why you have to give the give a damn go up there because then the perception of it is direct. Um, but it's also, she is saying it so that it can be worked on and so that growth can happen. And if it's, if it's unkind, that's when you start getting into the obnoxious aggression, which is the like asshole quadrant. Um, and that's where you start getting like resentment and like of all those things start building, I think there. Um, Casey, I think I saw you had your hand up earlier. That was just uh, two questions came to mind, and uh, I think I'll drop one of them. Uh, I'm curious how you've seen this helpful in your engagement with, uh, I don't know, in your personal relationships as well as with teams, which everyone want to address is having gone through and experienced this book and, and, and uh, focus on the radical candor. How have you helped that seem? Uh, how have you helped that seem? How have you helped that? How have you seen that move groups forward? Yeah, um, I think one way that I found it helpful is that it breaks it down into, so even sometimes I can just perceive that maybe, you know, especially if it's obnoxious, obnoxious, obnoxious aggression, is that, you know, it's maybe not taking it as personally as I could have, because I know that, or just giving people the benefit of the doubt where, you know, thank you for the feedback, and also, I wish it had been more, like, given more kindly. Um, and then I think in groups, I think it kind of can be helpful to have a common language to so that people kind of have an idea um, and moving people more towards the, you know, okay, so maybe you need to be more kind or more sincere because insincere, like kind feedback that's insincere also isn't that helpful because you, people can feel that, um, that, an alignment there. Um, I haven't, I think for me, it's impacted just in little bits of pieces. And then there's a lot more in the book, I think about the growth and things like that. And um, and as a, you know, her perspective as a boss, like how to, for example, ask for feedback and as a leader model it and giving it privately and praising publicly and, publicly and things like that. Um, I don't know if that totally answers your question, but it's kind of just, my experience with it. I found it helpful in my in my mindset. Any other kind of thoughts or questions? Yeah, the danger of weaponizing candor. Um, I think it's, you know, it is a thing where another thing is, you know, it's like we're not, we don't always fall in this quadrant over here. Um, you know, we have moments of either being unwilling to say something, you know, and it is like, there's a whole complex thing of being safe enough and like the power dynamics of who can give radical candor to who, um, which is making it very challenging. And, you know, also the idea that candor, you know, can be, you know, weaponized where it's really more obnoxious aggression or down this bottom part, it's not actually candor. It's just like, it's too challenging directly and not enough caring personally. Um, it is another challenge. I'm looking in the chat. Nice. 
Next one, you ready to move on to the next? Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, I'll go ahead and do the five practices and then uh, Nevada, do you want to tag team polarity management with me? <laughs> sure. Um, I think that's the next one that came came up. All right, so this one, I this is, I'm gonna say this a lot. I love this model. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, this one is the five practices, and it comes from uh, oh look at that my green screen is misbehaving. So this comes from the Leadership Challenge by Kuzis and Posner. Um, if you haven't read this book, don't because it's a cookbook. You're not meant to read it cover to cover. Okay, you are meant to kind of scan through it and pick the leadership practices that best apply to you. Now what they did is that they actually did this meta study of leadership and found all of these different kinds of practices. And what they found was, uh, is that you could basically boil them down into these five different practices. So the first is modeling the way, that is being an example. Um, you're setting an example, you're finding your voice, you're, you're, you're showing how to do this, okay? Um, Lauren, in a lot of ways, that's what we tried to do on the visioneering team for the rest of the company that we were a part of, is to model a different way of, of operating. Um, the next is inspiring a shared vision. So think step one in the Cotter change model. This is about envisioning a future, really painting a vivid picture of what the future looks like and enlisting others. Um, using something like, you know, a Grove story map is a great way to do that. Um, next is challenging the process. These are your disruptors. So this is searching for opportunities, experimenting, taking risks. What if we did this? What if we did that? You know, iterating quickly, um, experimenting, being agile, that's challenging the process. Then you've got enabling others to act. So that is being a bridge. You're fostering collaboration. You're strengthening others. This is where coaching shows up, is in enabling others to act. And then finally, encouraging the heart. This is speaking to the affect side. This is speaking to the feelers that are in the room. So it's recognizing contributions, ce celebrating values, and victories. All right, now here's there's a modality that goes with this one. So I've recreated your names on sticky notes. The green one is the one that you're good at, good at. And so what I would say is, is grab the sticky note with your name on it, the green one. Which of these would you say is a strength of yours? And this is exactly the way that I do this in a group. So I do a quick overview of the model and then I've got a bunch of sticky notes with people's names on it and they drop their names on what their strength is. The pink one is what you're not so good at. So if you've got a pink one, that's a challenge for you. So you can drag and drop that one. Okay. We really? need slightly more transparent stickies. <laughs> <laughs> or smaller. That's my, that's my radical candor feedback. <laughs> you know, there's a danger in weaponizing candor. <laughs> Okay, so just a guess. Now that we know what people's strengths and development opportunities are, where would you go from here if you had this data? Any thoughts? Ooh, I want them to learn from each other. Word. So that's where you set them up in peer coaching relationships. Mm. So you say, okay, pair up, right? Pick somebody that you want to work with to develop whatever it is, and then we'll switch it up later. That's exactly right. Mm. Yeah. Nice. Oh wait, Brian, this is this is exactly one of the reasons I've loved working with you. <laughs> I noticed that our sticker went in the bottom right corner. There's a pink and a green right next to each other. And I have felt like this that has been a very much a, a peer mentoring relationship. Totally, thing. totally. Thank yeah. you for that. Okay. Uh, what are your questions for on, on this one? All right, let's go ahead and move on. Um, so Nevada, can we tag team? Polarity management? <laughs> <laughs> a late addition, a late addition to the board. Where are we? Yeah, this visual is giving me a little bit of the heebie-jeebies, but yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah. I we get Go ahead, you, you start. You want me to take a start? Okay, so the idea here, anyone familiar with kind of um, navigating polarities or pulling, just raise your hand, yeah. So somebody. Rika, Lori. Oh, so please, yeah, jump in. We'll take an inelegant stab at it, but um, I've used it mostly in, in, with, uh, coaching clients, but they, the, the problem statement being that people tend to think in, in binaries, right. in either ors. So if you think about having, a uh, you know, on the poles that you might have, um, stability and flexibility, right. On the poles. 
Um, and that people tend to see the good part of where they are on the pole. Let's say if I'm on flexibility, I see the all the possibilities of flexibility, and I only see the negative the negatives of stability. The person on the stability pole sees the positives of their pole, the negative of the other poles, and so never the twain shall meet. So the polarity mapping helps um, us uncover what's the good side of the other pole and then work together to find the third way in the middle. And what I like about that third way is the idea of you're managing or navigating the polarities, never solving them because they can't be solved. And that you have to actually go through the heart and actually have um, you know, a heartfelt dialogue and connection and conversation to be able to discover the third way up the middle. So you can't really just do it intellectually. So that's my my stab. Please add. What did I miss? Add to the add to the flavor of the. Uh, I've got a I've got a sw slight twist for the towards the applied version of this. Um, there is a you can find a, a an online template pretty easily that takes this and turns it into really what is a 16 step process for reframing <laughs> a problem. And it is you know it's a little intense, right? But it it has you first identifying those two poles, figuring out what the best case scenario looks like, the worst case scenario looks like. Um, looking at them in terms of the activity, what is it if this is happening, looking at them when it happens, uh, when these things are at rest, so when there's inactivity, and then what are the actions and early warnings. There are some, again, there's some online templates that will take you through that as a guided process. Um, what is, I think, essentially uh, reframing something so that you can just look at it from a lens of, all right, how, what, what, how can we actually work with this? Um, and again, we'll open this up to anybody else who's familiar. Lori, have you got something on this one? Yeah, I was just going to say this is um, this is actually really a marvelous tool to use when you talk about expanding perspective, um, and because it really uh, brings forward the fact that there is no right and no wrong. There is there is really just uh, our perceptions about what you know what the right and wrong is um, based on what side of the polarity that we're sitting on. And so it's a really marvelous for expanding people's perspective and it creates quite a lot of space for difference. Um, so it's really useful when you have those kind of wicked problems where there is no one right way. Nice, thank you. So questions on this one, Eileen, Lauren? I was just going to add on to what Lauren put into chat that polarities can never be solved. Um, I've used kind of that that polarities example as it's it's just this tension in coaching individual coaching. It's just this tension that exists, and it works really nicely with acceptance commitment therapy as well. Mm -hmm. Some of those um, principles, um, particularly, you have it here about identifying difficulties that just can't be solved. That you just have to accept and and accept that that tension is always going to be there nice thank you and lauren looks like you get the last thought on that or then carla i was just curious nevada when you are leading a workshop where it comes up um to me it seems like oh my cat's going to contribute um if you heard that so it to me it seems like this is sort of a, a principle something you might offer either at the beginning of a workshop or at some point when it seems to be relevant and do a relatively light touch on it I'm just curious about that yeah i think a light touch is good i think that the challenge is getting the polarities named right and those of you that have used it more might might have more experience but in my experience it's like you know, making sure that those poles are named in a way that one is not better or worse sounding, that they're both without judgment. So that takes some work with the team to really even that out. So a light touch can be a little tricky, right? Because it actually takes some some thinking to get the poles right and have them think through that together. So, yeah. so it can be a pretty deep dive. I see. And, and do you do kind of like a, um, like a T-chart type of thing and mural or something like that is... Yeah, you could do. There's lots of templates out there for polarity mapping. Cool. Okay, thank you. I'm done. I'm complete. It's a the 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 thought is to do a neutrally themed and worded poll, and you know, just as Nevada said, it's uh, this is my attempt to go through it. It is again, it's a 16 part process to get through it from start to finish, um, and and so it's intense, you know, following that. Um, I think Nevada, the next one is yours, unless we've got anything more on this. I don't see it. Um, Ramika, did you have anything else? I know you were you had some experience with it too. 
Yes, um, for the most part, what you said was was perfect. Um, there are multiple templates, and then even the simple way is to just start with the four quadrant. And if people are in the room, you have them put the sticky notes down there, and then you create the themes and go from there. Um, for the one for coaching, um, where it starts with the heart, um, when you're looking at it from an OD perspective, we don't always have the heart because the head. Everybody's going straight to the head and. For them, the head knows what the head wants, but it really doesn't. And so it sometimes shows up a little bit differently when you're coaching a person through polarities than you would when you're looking at an organizational challenge or where there's some, some difference that keeps the organization stuck. So it's really understanding contextually where are we trying to go with this and how could we best use the polarity because it's really not a one it, despite the, the steps, it's not one size fit all. You still have to sort of tailor that to what the actual need is. And that will look different from every person and draw from these templates to do that. So there's mm. multiple opportunities for more templates. Um, <laughs> the more you do polarities in my opinion, but from a coaching perspective, yes, you, there's a bit of a slight twist to it when you're looking at it from let's kind of get to the heart of what's happening here and why we can't move forward. The awesome. coaching kind of gets weaved in a little bit, but yes, what everybody said was, was perfect. Hmm. Thanks, Ramika. Um, Thank you. So Nevada, I think the next one's yours. Let me just pull everybody over to that one. Cool, and, and I'm sure that most of you or some, some of you know some of this. So and like, if you raise your hand, if you've heard of the dra drama triangle, which is the bottom piece of this. Yeah, right. So the, the nice thing about this model is it says, okay, there's this drama triangle that we go where we play either uh, one of these roles where, you know, I don't have choice. I'm a victim, I'm a rescuer, I'm a persecutor. So we go there in the drama triangle. And then uh, in this model, in the empowerment dynamic, there's an alternative triangle to move towards the one above the line. And in conscious leadership group, they talk a lot about being below the line or above the line. If you're familiar with the leadership circle, that might also start to resonate. And above the line, we have more choice. So victim moves into creator, persecutor moves into challenger, rescuer moves into coach. And the idea is essentially you're in a more choiceful and empowered state uh, to face, face the leadership challenges in front of you. So that's that quick and dirty overview. If anyone wants to jump in and share about either the bottom part of that or the top, please do. I like how you phrased uh, above the line, you have more choice because uh, almost the drama triangle always centers around in some ways, uh, it's kind of the role you play or the role you're playing and how do you shift that around to um, a more creative space? I, like, mm. I really like the way you put that. Oh yeah, creative is such a great word. Yeah, for that, for that above the line perspective. And the conscious leadership group is really great about saying the first step is to say, where are you? Are you above the line or below the line to, to, to recognize that? And then to say, uh, you know, are you willing to move? Because sometimes we're in victim mode. We're just not ready to move out of there yet. So that's the second question before we try to push, push ourselves over into the empowerment dynamic, the dynamic or the top of the triangle there. You think you probably can see the the applications here in coaching, but also you know with with teams, right? In the way that they're framing problems, right? Are they framing it as victims? Are they framing their work as rescuers, right? So it has an application here, I think, for teams as well, and also organizational cultures. Ramika, did you have something on this one? I had a question. So I love this because I've never seen it before, but. Um, when I look, when you look at it from a person who probably isn't as self-aware, the language of, am I really a victim, a rescuer, or a persecutor? How do you get someone to sort of even acknowledge that that's where they are? Hmm. Yeah, I think there's some good descriptions about what it looks like to be the victim, but yeah, this is a self-awareness thing, right? Like on this, you know, if are people willing to look at, you know, to look at themselves in that way? And you know when we come in and we don't meet them where they're where they're at, right? It it doesn't resonate. So I think there's some sensitivity here about what the audience you're working with for sure. It's a great point. Oh, that people may think res the rescuer actually is like a healthy way to be, 
right? Like, especially if you're, you know, Enneagram two, somewhere in there, maybe you're like, oh, rescuer sounds real good. That feels good to me. Um, and in fact, you're actually not helping that person, right? By stepping in and rescuing them and they're not building the skills. So, so the move there is to move to coaching. Nice. Rachel, did you have something on this? Nope, I was just saying, oh. okay. just the same as muting or never mind. Anything else on the dreaded drama triangle before we go on and hit the next one? Uh, Casey. Hey, just one quick, quick question for Nevada. It almost seems that maybe the way it's drawn is that whatever letters are close, for example, if you're a persecutor, shift to challenge, or if you're a rescuer, shift to coach. If you're a victim, switch to creator. Is that kind of the, the, the dynamics? Yeah. You find that, you whatever, okay, good. Thank you. That's usually the move that they say. And to Lori's point, it's also like, you know, if I'm a, uh, you know, changing how we see the other person too, right? Instead of seeing them as a persecutor, can we do the flip and see them as a challenger? It's a nice addition, Lori. I think that's all for this one. Um, Nevada, yours are popular. The next two are yours as well. Uh, let me pull you over to the next. I'll keep it quick then, I promise. Yeah, you're good. Um, oh, good. I'm glad you guys were interested. This is my, I love this one. So this is from um, CTI or uh, Coactive Training. So the um, originally called Coaches Training Institute, now called Coactive Training, <laughs> um, but it comes from this. Um, the idea of coactive is that there's both a being and a doing in everything, right? This is actually yin and yang, right? There's a relational and an action and a driving part to everything we do. And if we keep, if those aren't in balance, we end up with an um, an overactive action or an overactive active, and we get ourselves into trouble, right? Because we haven't we haven't stayed in relationship to the other person or the system or ourselves. Um, so this is a nice model. I think it it confronts a little bit of our Western tendency to say that being a leader out front is being a leader, and there's many other ways to be a leader. And I think that's what this this shows, which is really beautiful. And it gives sort of five ways to be a leader. Imagine they're kind of bubbles you know, like intersecting. So, and it starts with the leader within, which is about the awareness, growing yourself and your own relationship to yourself and being able to come from there as a starting point in your leadership. And then there's ability to move into being a leader out front, guiding people, showing where people go. This is sort of traditional Western model, model of leadership. And then there might be times where that's totally inappropriate, right? We're actually the move to is to be a leader beside or really to be a partner with someone, a great collaborator, and you're supporting them and working together very co-actively to move something forward or to be a leader behind and facilitators. We know this really well, right? You're kind of you're you're encouraging and coaching and supporting from behind in a less visible way. And then there's this fifth bubble, which is really the um, leading from the field, which is um, sort of sensing into your intuition and your instinct and what's needed in the greater system from you at any given time. So the model is really saying there's different ways to lead and there's different times to lead and we can move a little bit like in situational leadership, right? We can, we can, we can and should move and flex our style of leadership and how we show up depending on what's happening in the environment and what's needed from us and also depending on what the impact that we want to have. So I love this model, it's really close to my heart. So glad that you guys were interested in it. Cool. Any comments, questions for Nevada on this one? So, yeah, Lori. I, 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 so is the conversation around this, what is, what is my, you know, do I have a particular style or a preference? And then when is different approaches appropriate or needed? Are those some of the conversations that you might have using this model? Yeah, I think so. And it's often, right, for a lot of folks, it's like even reframing and, and broadening the lens about what leadership is, right? So that we sometimes say leader from every seat, but this is a nice way to go in a little more deeply to it. And also the necessity of the self-awareness uh, and working on yourself to show up as, as a leader in any of these ways and, and how important that is. I haven't ever done it as like a post-it note exercise or anything like that. It's more, I've only used it more conceptually. Cool. Ready to go hit the next one? I think that one's yours as well, Nevada. Let me go ahead and uh, summon people over. Okay. Oh yeah, cool. Okay. 
Uh, some of you may just may know this a little slightly differently, but is anyone familiar with Team Coaching International? It was founded by Phil Sandal, who worked at CTI and um, created kind of more of a, a team coaching organization. Anyway, this is the team from the team diagnostic. Um, and I like this one. It essentially says, look, as a, as a team or an organization, you're going to fall somewhere on this two by two matrix. You're either going to be um, there's sort of a level of productivity, and then there's a level of positivity. And in positivity, there's there's like seven strengths in productivity, and has to do with all those things about goal orientation and you know getting work done and resources and all that stuff that you would normally expect. And then there's like seven strengths under positivity that are things like trust and camaraderie and uh, respectful communication. So seven there's seven productivity strengths, seven positivity strengths and the idea is that a high performing team has both high productivity and high positivity. So the teams on the top right quadrant are going to be the, the high performing teams. Um, this is a super nice model. I'm using this right now with a team where um, they just over index so heavily on goal orientation and spend no time on relationships. Mm -hmm. So this felt like a really good model to help mirror the system, uh, mirror the system back to them. So again, like we could have used, you know, the Drexler Slivet model because they're also having problems with it with shared commitment at the bottom of the V, but this one felt more on the nose for them in terms of what was showing up in the organization. And you get these really cool in the team diagnostic when you actually do the assessment, you get these really cool like polarity diag, you get the like polar diagrams, then you get uh, like the box that shows where, where they are on this two by two matrix. It has a lot of visual, nice really visual um, feedback for the team too. So this is really cool, Nevada. If if I may, I'd like to I'd like to add on to this one because what this one looks like to me is what's uh, the Glenda Oyang difference matrix. Hmm. If you were to take it and turn it ninety degrees, I think you'd get almost the same thing, uh, where you know she talks of, uh, in terms of the difference between a team, and she's talking about uh, really cognitive diversity there, um, the degree of difference among team members. And then the degree of interaction, which you could call, you know, productivity on yours. What I like about Glenda Oyang's is that the one on the right actually has suggested movements that you can apply to move a group either up or down um, across the model so that they can actually, you know, move from one phase to another. As you were saying, if you've got a team that's over indexing, the second half of Glenda's model uh, will tell you, okay, well, here's how to move them out of that and to get them into a different quadrant. Hmm. Anyway, check it out. It's a good one. Um, this one also works really well for uh, DEI work. Um, so questions, comments for Nevada before we move on to the next one. And Lori, you're up for the next one. <laughs> okay. No. So Lori, how would you feel about talking about the team performance model? Because that was one that we dropped on here um, along with the Arthur Young model. And that one actually got the next uh, number of votes. Would you be okay kind of giving us a, a quick overview of it? I can do it, but you're the expert. Sure, I would be happy to uh, do a few moments on this. Okay, let me um, pull people over. Oh. Getting kind of down there in the numbers. No, um, no, so you gotta add one plus five, which is six. <laughs> oh, the reflexive universe. Oh, okay. So it's the combination of the two. All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll look at the re reflexive universe um, model, which is the one over there on the right, which is Arthur Young's theory of process. Um, Arthur Young was a physicist who was working on uh, an integrated theory of everything, which is what physicists do when they drink beer. And, um, uh, you know, what what is a couple of key things to think about with this model is that it's a process model as opposed to being a snapshot in time model. Um, and the idea is that all process moves between freedom, which is all about possibility and potential, and constraint, which is all about, well, constraint, you know, being locked in place. And so, from a physicist point of view, it's moving from the potentiality of light, which is just, you know, electrons moving through space, 
down through the stages of electrons binding themselves at the bottom into uh, you know, molecules. And then that's the ultimate of constraint. You know, those everything's just kind of constrained together in a molecule. And then how do those molecules then break free to get back up into full potential again? And what they do is they create life. And um, eventually they get up into consciousness, which is um, complete um, freedom uh, and potential and possibility. So, um, so each of these different, uh, so that's just kind of a very quick uh, summary on that. And so what David Sibbett has been doing is he's been spending his life bringing this model to life in practical, useful models, um, which include the group graphics keyboard, the team performance model, the stages of organization in particular, and now um, the seven challenges of change, which is the, um, the latest model, latest model um, where you're looking at in team performance, this idea of going from being the visionary leader at, you know, at the, at the great, at the highest potential to use some of the language we've been talking about all the way down at the bottom to being the just get it done leader. Um, where you're just really totally focused on on task and result. Um, in, in between, um, there's you know people and um, what it is that you're trying to actually bring into form. Um, so that's the the theoretical uh, dive in on. Uh, this and Brian, you want to add anything from? I, I just have a question for you. So, how often do you share this model with with your clients, Lori? I have not ever shared this model <laughs> with my clients. I was I was wondering? Okay. <laughs> well, this is this is you know this is a this is kind of a chewy, you know, model for folks who are model nerds to uh, you know kind of get excited about and dive in on this is not a model for most organizations that are trying to like you know sell a product or a service and get something done you know Carla, did you longer. did you have a question on this one yeah so i had never seen it before um and i do drexler submit you know work a lot i mean i i love the grove stuff and i use team performance model probably is my go-to um when i'm working with teams because it's a you know a little bit step up from tuckerman but um so thank you for introducing this one as the source or inspiration. Yeah, it under, underlies it. Cool. Other questions about either the reflexive universe or the team performance model, if you want to do a twofer for this one, which is, uh, of course, the team performance model is based on this one. Um, oh, I can just comment on team performance model. Um, I I have done the actual assessment that they have online for, but I also use it, you know, in the good old fashioned dot way and have individuals do their own diagnosis and, you know, put the dots and then discuss um, what we need to do to, to, to move um, through the model. And you know, I usually spend a lot of time, I, I mean, I actually use the book and have exercises behind, behind each one of these bubbles that if they're having trust issues, spend the most time on that before going through um, to, to really try to move people to what it means to be a high performing team. So I could see how this one would work well with the one we discussed earlier about high performing teams. Which one was that? I'm already getting my models mixed up, but yeah. I think you mentioned it. That was the Tuckman one, right? Yeah. No, no, no. It was the one with the um with the squares that we did. Oh, that was team favorite. diagnostic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I like the I'd like to use that one with this one sometime moving forward. Yep. And Carla, when you mentioned the book, was it this one? Uh it's that one, but there's also one visual teams. Oh, yeah. And there is actually a what he calls a field guide that goes with this team performance model, which again behind each and, and we had an old version that we had at AU. 
um, that we, at least I got when I did my team dynamics class, but um, it actually has, you know, a lot of our traditional exercises that you could do behind each one of the steps in the team performance model to help move people along. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Anything else on this one before we move on? One of the things that I, I like to, um, uh, that people aren't familiar, don't think about with this model is that embedded in this model are a lot of the other models. So for instance, Lencioni's models mm -hmm. um, are all about the relationship component of things. And so if you actually take Lencioni's model and just drop it, ka -chunk, right into stage two, stage six, um, then all of a sudden you can use that model kind of within a larger context of what it is that a team is doing. So um, many of these models, uh, what's interesting about the team performance model is because it's based on physics, is that you can fit almost any model into this. The Kinefin model is the one that I have struggled with <laughs> to try and, 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 and figure out how it fits up. But uh, most other models, you can you can sort of fit it in, make connections somehow. So nice segue <laughs> because the next highest vote was the, I'm, I'm not going to pronounce this right. Nevada, you want to help me out? Is it? Uh, Kinevin. Kinevin. Okay. <laughs> So let's take a look at that one. I think uh, Nevada, you know this one pretty well. And I, Lauren, I think you do too, right? Well, I've talked a lot, Lauren. You want to take a stab? How is it pronounced, Brian? Uh, no way. I'm not, I'm not going there. I'm going to get it <laughs> I, I've heard it pronounced Kinefin. Sort of. It's, it's, it's Welsh. Jinx. Um, For those who speak Welsh. Everything I know I got from an article and I had to read draw it for myself because it was it was so um i i i didn't i don't, I don't use the quadrants so i would love to hear more about the quadrants i ended up just kind of creating my own linear sketch notes and um that are just based on the framework and the way that i go through it with a with a group is just at a very high level. Let me just say the reason I like this model is because I think it's a nice complement to situational leadership because it's a way of helping leaders see how they can situationally operate with the organization, not just with maybe one person, like a situation, situational leadership. I'm sure you can apply it organizationally, but I like the Kinevin model um, because I think it has a wider organizational application. So the way that I set it up is to say, um, you know, our problems can either be simple, complicated, complex, or chaotic. And a lot of times we, we think that our problems are simple <laughs> in the land of known, uh, no knowns. And so in that, in that space, every, sorry, the screen's moving around and it's throwing me. <laughs> Stop summoning. Um, so in simple, there is a, there's a problem and there's a simple solution and complicated, there's a problem. And then there's potentially multiple solutions. Um, when you take the car to a, um, you know, the car is making a funny noise. You take it into the shop and you say, it's making a funny noise and they're going to diagnose this, diagnose, uh, diagnose it for you. That's complicated. And then in, in complex, this is the land of unknown unknowns or the domain of emergence. And in, in this space, there are many problems and many possible solutions. <laughs> and so the what's used in the article that I read, and I liked this example from Apollo 13, where he dumps all the things out of the box and says, this is what the astronauts have figured out. And so that I think was a good example of a complex problem. And then finally, in a, a chaotic, which is the land of unknowables where things are just so, so crazy that the only way to act in that, in that way is to, um, is to staunch the bleeding. And so 9-11 or uh, natural disasters would be in, in the chaotic realm. And so or, I usually say organizations often think of problems as simple or complicated, but they're really complex and chaotic. Why I like this, sorry, I'm geeking out over here. Why I really like this is that 
the difference in how you have to operate as a leader between complex and chaotic is such a fine line because in chaos, you have to act and you have to be directive because time is of the essence, but in complexity, you have to kind of step back and put and allow people to move through a process. And as a leader, that is really hard to sense into what is appropriate between that complex and chaotic line. I am I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> I love this model. <laughs> I, I love the I love this one too. I think a couple of things that maybe I would add on is um, less about problem solving, right? Because in complexity, most things can actually be solved. But again, it's sort of about navigating. So we're sort of in this territory of of polarities often with complexity and trade offs. Um, and so it's a slightly different way of thinking about it. So it helps with decision making, right? Not problem solving. So maybe I would just tweak the language a little bit there. Um, and there's something that it's a sensing tool, right? Like we're, we're really in this territory of um, working within systems and thinking about like team of teams, huge complex systems, right? How do we move through that? Um, for example, I'm working with um, number of teams that are team of teams right where there's like so much cross-functional collaboration that's required and it's a whole new kind of collaboration true collaboration not coordination which is what we often call collaboration right like they really have to like give up power in order to navigate these complex environments together and they kind of have to like do something <laughs> and then sense and then respond Right. There's not really like planning that can happen because you there's too much and too many unknowns. Um, so just maybe a few additions there. But yeah, thanks for laying the foundation, Lauren. It was great. Cool. Thank you, Nevada and Lauren. And how do you pronounce it? <laughs> <laughs> I heard from a British person, Knevin. <laughs> okay. Because I realized I heard it from Lori Durnell. So that's as good as my sources, um, which is good, you know. All right, any other comments on this model, on this Scottish model before we move on, or Welsh model, sorry, before we move on? Nevin. I'll throw something out. Yeah. Um, I just realized my main client is dealing in a world uh, that's complex and chaotic with, with processes designed for a simple world. Uh, it's kind of where they're at. Um, mm. nice. And you can say the government process is put in place to design for a simpler world. No, thanks. This is very helpful, very helpful. Cool. Well, I just I love what you said about that, because in some ways, like we as humans, like have a, a system that's designed for a more simple world. Right. And as we're moving into the in so much complexity, it's like our limbic systems are actually not don't like that. Right. <laughs> so we're actually designed for a different world than we're living in in some ways. Yeah. You mind if I build upon that, Nevada? It made me think Please. about uh, exponential change. Uh, yeah, uh, we're living in a world that's changing faster than ever changed beforehand. When we look behind us, it's a slow meandering line that goes all the way to the horizon. And when we turn around, and look in front of us, it's the wall and our brain can't comprehend it. That's kind of what I think about what you said there. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next one. But before we do, I just wanna do a quick check-in. How is the pace? How is this going? Um, any requests? Remember that's one of our ground rules to make requests. So thumbs up from Jenny. Um, is this working out for you? Okay, let's keep pushing through it then. So the next one is a, a very quick hit. Um, so this is this is one I use all the time. Um, and I've got this as a principal poster on Tyvek because the first like 10 I just tore through because I use them so much. It's very simple, but it's the idea that there is a task world and that there is a human world. And that the task world is one of your job jar it's what's in your position description it's what's clogging up your inbox it's what's on your task list it's what's filling up your calendar that's the task world the human world is the one of interpersonal connections it's the one of relationships this is actually where communication lives in the human world and there are a lot of clients i think that we have that tend to focus on the task world and tend to ignore the human world and when they do that anybody here seen stranger things on netflix yeah, so the human, it sort of like becomes like the upside down. It's like, you know, but like twisted for evil because the human world will overtake the task world if it's not actually attended to. Um, I was facilitating once for this uh, uh, federal agency, which had been three separate agencies 
And they were told by mandate that the three of you, guess what? Now you're one agency, figure it out. And they only had communicated by email and phone call, and they had never got together before for the better part of a year. And so they came in to do a kind of a light design thinking workshop for the first time. They had never met face to face before. And when they came into this design thinking workshop where I was a co-facilitator, um, it was like, boom, like this human world had just like, it, it, it had festered and it had exploded like a volcano and it just overtook everything. And my co-facilitator, who's a brilliant, you know, design thinker had no idea what was going on. Um, and what had happened is, is that they had been making up stories about themselves for months and months. And so I told my co-facilitator, I'm like, okay, I can help you with this, but I need you to get out of the room. I'm going to have to do something completely different here. And so we completely changed the, uh, the tenure of the meeting. I had, we got rid of everything. I had everybody sit in a circle of chairs. That's all they had. I didn't let them bring anything else. And we flipped that whole thing to do some group coaching. But what, what got there is that they had ignored the human world um, at, and at, to the expense of the, the task world. It eventually overtook things. And so Rachel and I are actually using this model with, uh, with one of her clients right now, where we will go in for a day and in the morning, we'll focus on the human world. And then in the afternoon, we'll focus on the task world. And so we do this to really draw a line and say, look, the things that we do in the room with, with you all, we do it for, the, for a reason. Okay? That's a much longer explanation than what I ever give when I actually introduce this. Um, if you're going to use it, I would say just sketch it up just like this. It's a good principal poster. And you can point to it and it's it's a great way of saying here's why we do a lot of the work that we do carla what do you got on this one question uh question so is the book is is the william dyer book what one could read to get more grounded uh, to be really honest this? with you i never read the book <laughs> i okay. know that he was the one that attributed like he's the one that's attributed to this concept but i i yeah. didn't read the book okay sorry mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, the next one, let's see. Oh, and Lauren just stepped out. Lauren, let's see if she comes back. Wait, here she comes. <laughs> Lauren, the next one's yours, actually. You want to do the roller coaster of change? Sure. Sorry. I'm out of breath. <laughs> um, so, so this, this was, um, it's based, this is based on, the uh, I don't know, Brian. Maybe you want to maybe you wanted to show the the one that you used earlier today. Yeah, um, it. yeah, because it's it's kind of based on that. But it's it's sort of a hybrid model of how people tend to react to change and also the um, change adoption curve. And so as you as you as you go through the model, <laughs> if you are experiencing a roller coaster of change, you know, what would you be, what, what would you be thinking, feeling at each stage? So in, in, in the beginning, um, let's do this. Sounds good. We get it as you go over the roller coaster. Um, sorry, I need to get over back to mural because I'm looking at this really small in my laptop screen and that's just not working for me. Now I can zoom in. Yes. Um, so as you go over the roller coaster, we'll go with it. Um, on the other side, if we have to, and then what's going on, then nothing is broken and, and heck no. And so um, so it's sort of this idea that, um, and Brian Brian put the, what's behind it below. So in the there's sort of the early adopters and then there's the laggards. And so the um, so the the roller coaster is is lined up against against that. So I, I would I would look at the one that Brian put below that so that you can kind of see um what i'm what i attempted to do with this in, in terms of saying this is what you might hear from early adopters and here's what you might hear from the laggards and then um and then and then my my point that i usually just try to say is is listen to your laggards <laughs> because it's it's the people that are resisting the change are the ones that that are going to give you that fuel for renewal and growth um I'm going to toss it back to Brian to thank you, Lauren. Way to sprint on over here to, to grab that one. I didn't realize you were in your kitchen. Sorry about that. Um, 
<laughs> so any other questions, comments about this one before we move on? Mateo, you know, this is home base for you. If there's, if there's anything you want to weigh in on this one. Uh, sorry, Lauren, did you mention where you need, where you should invest in your organization <clears throat> with the uh, early adopters? No, 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 build, build on it. I did not talk about that. Go. Cool. Yeah, I just, I recall this mention of, of Chris McGough teaching this. Um, so the primes, uh, this is one of the primes um, and how your focus area, um, especially if you're pursuing like a high performing organization is to leverage those early adopters that at 13% on the left, um, as that will pull the early majority, late majority uh, along. Uh, and don't waste your energy on visionaries and never mind the laggards. Basically, it's a it's a call to action and the fewest, most critical moves uh, to move your organization forward. Thank you, Mateo. You bet. Um, any other questions, comments about the adoption curve or the roller coaster of change before we move on? Mateo, the next one is yours, I think. It's the uh, the Thomas Kilman. You ready for it? And if you want, I've got some pink and green stickies for you. If you want to repeat like what we did with the five practices. Actually, uh, yeah. Rachel, didn't, did you drop this in here? And I just... Oh, that one may be Rachel. My bad. Yeah. She'll do much better at this than I, considering I called the wrong one up. I Rachel, was you want to do this one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so I haven't used this a ton, but this is something that I guess I re started learning about recently and they just really opened up my lens on um, conflict. And it's just a mix of, core, like I just, the, the idea of, we often get stuck I think with compromising and sometimes that's not, not necessarily the way to work with it. And so just the, the cooperativeness and that's relationship-based and then the assertiveness is issue-based. You kind of see that, you know, avoiding it is really, you know, someone ghosting or, you know, someone just being absent or stonewalling. Accommodating is really maybe choosing the relationship over, you know, the issue. Compromising, I think we're all familiar with. You try and, you know, create something that is um, acceptable to both or all parties. Competing is, you know, the one that maybe is most often perceived as um, how we're, you know, resolving differences. I guess it's another way to think about conflict, you know, resolving differences. And then collaborating is also another way to resolve differences, which is interesting because people might not often think of collaborating as difference resolving, which I think is a really interesting thing. Um, and so I'm not actually sure what the how we're gonna put people on it. Maybe, um, I actually, I'm gonna guess this and then Brian, you can just check me. I would have people maybe put their name with their circle on the, the box where they maybe fall most often um, in their, um, when they're resolving issues. So would that be the question you'd have asked Brian? Yeah. So like same as with the five practices, you know, maybe where do you see a strength and where is a weakness? Yes. You have two colors. Yep. So green is strength. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel like the other option would be on a good day, on a bad day. Yeah. yeah. And I think this is also, it's very, it can be like, depending on the relationship with the person, depending on the issue and another layer I've actually like I've heard this is um thinking about you know especially I think with accommodating you know how important is the issue like if you really care a lot you might not want to accommodate but if it's something that you're like yeah I could eat a burger I could eat a salad like I really doesn't matter to me um you know it's a low there's not a lot of I guess assertiveness in the in this um this level here, but a lot of weight to the, the issue, which is another layer of that. Yeah. Cool. So any comments, add-ons for Rachel with regards to the Thomas Kilman? Okay, this is another, actually, this is really getting more towards like a team model, even though you can give it as like an individual assessment. I think that this is a good one to do with teams because it'll show, okay, why is it that 
you know, Brian is always seems like he's like fighting tooth and nail for everything. Well, you know, that's his, his go to mode is, is he tends to be a computer. Um, the other thing is, is that, you know, I'm, I'm going to restate something that Rachel said. What's cool about this one is that it's also a prescriptive tool, right? So far, all we've shown you is diagnostic tools. This one's prescriptive. So you can ask yourself, hey, how important is this issue to me? Do I really care about it? Is it something worth falling on my sword or, you know, could I give a flip? And how important is the relationship to me? You know, is this a really super critical relationship or not so much? So like if the issue is not important, but the relationship is, then I'm going to accommodate. So it will actually tell me what my preferred mode is. This is why my wife and I, we keep saying, well, where do you want to go for dinner on Friday? No, where do you want to go for dinner on Friday? Issue not that important, relationship super important. Okay, cool. Anything else on this one before we move on? I think just one observation or an interesting thing about the accommodating is I think sometimes we can get into different, like which is maybe perceived as the better way to 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 resolve conflicts. And sometimes, you know, you don't want to like be a doormat, but also I think, you know, it goes back to the intention of it. Um, like if you're intentionally being accommodated because, you know, like Brian just said, versus like habitually or for other like maybe less healthy reasons of accommodating when you really you know want to be in a place. I think that's an interesting another layer to kind of view that. Nice. Thanks for that, Rachel. Okay, the next one is the reinventing organizations map. Um, <laughs> yeah, Eileen's like applauding. Okay, so wh whose was this one? Because I don't see the name. I I dropped this in. Um, I don't remember where I got it, and I have not really used it. I just found it very <laughs> interesting. Um, so this is more of a. Isn't this curious? Shall we explore this together? Um, yeah. <laughs> I feel like I should know this one, but I don't. <laughs> Yeah. Um, it's so easy to remember. What's the problem? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on. So I think the the first thing I want to make sure people are aware of is this is kind of based on the reinventing organizations model, which is kind of really puts teal, like a teal organization as the, the way to maybe operate, which may be, you know, depending on the values and the the model might be good um but i think it's just an interesting way to think about because the layers of you know like where is the loyalty if i'm interested in, like is it to the boss like is it to the colleagues is it to the success is it personal is it to the purpose and this might be an interesting you know way to kind of maybe even diagnose diagnose it's not a word but diagnose where people are in the team and where you know, the behaviors, like, especially, you know, like the, the balance of the, the collective behaviors, both interior and exterior, and then the individual behaviors might be just interesting to provide insight. Nevada, can you tell us, I, I've never heard of spiral dynamics before. What is that? Oh, God, now you're really testing my recall. But I mean, I mean you said it, you dropped it in the chat. <laughs> well, spiral dynamics has to do with this idea of like, um, the evolution of consciousness and how we spiral and we integrate the lower colors as we go up the spiral um and the colors align with there's more in the spiral dynamics but it moves from red up to teal so that's what i was um, noticing and i think that's where like lalu got got the original kind of teal color for for reinventing organizations i had no idea that is is that cool. ken wilbur thing uh i don't know because he's integral theory and spiral dynamics is something else i learned about it from this woman um deborah Uten, but she, i mean she's not like the founder of spiral dynamics but there she, was a, in the bottom corner you can see there's inspired by the integral competence model frederick lalu ken wilbur um, don beck um otten so a lot of people so i think there's maybe it is ken wilbur, the spiral yeah. dynamics i don't remember if you haven't read Reinventing Organizations, I just dropped the whole book into Zoom chat um, as a PDF. I, I think that's, if you want to be friends with me, that's required reading. <laughs> that's, that's a, that is a really, really, oh, look, Rachel's got hers. Very nice. Um, yeah, actually, not to get too behind the curtain here, but we really intentionally decided to uh, pull Nova Scribes together as a teal organization. Um, <laughs> and so if you want to geek out on that, like we can talk about it. 
It's cool. Now, 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 Brian, is this the book or just the graphic novel? You That's the same thing. Okay. Right. And I kind of resent the kind of the implication behind, you know, the disdain of a graphic novel that it's not <laughs> the real book. It is. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's it. There's two versions of it. Um, this is the one that you want. You don't want the one with the butterflies on the front because this one's much prettier. This is the illustrated version. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Casey. All right. Um, anything else on this one before we move on? <laughs> just, I'm just sitting here staring at it trying to understand. So you yeah. really have to kind of go from the outside in. You have, you have to you have to look at the axes and then, right. and then analyze those pieces. And, and I can, I, I think the part that just confuses me is all of the things in the white. And I just want to know where they got those things. Like I, I can kind of see it, but. Hmm. Well, um, let, me, let me see if I can take a crack at it, if that's okay. Um, yeah. So I think the, the important place to start is actually on the left where you've got the stages of organizational development. So this is what Nevada was talking about with like with the spiral that an organization at its most basic is impulsive and then a little bit more involved, it's gonna become conformist. And then beyond that, it's gonna become achievement oriented and then pluralistic and then getting to evolutionary. So that's, that is the evolution of organizations. Um, an impulsive organization, that's like a mafia, okay? Um, conformist, that's a hierarchy. Um, achievement, that's market driven. Um, pluralistic, this is like a not-for-profit or an NGO. And then a teal organization, well, those are few and far between. That's what that's a holistic organization. And so if you then take that and then apply it to the, the concentric circles, you go from the outs inside out, from the more basic organizations to the more evolved organization, along those, I'll, I'll use the word competencies, to say here is let's start at like around the, the nine o'clock area. This is how trust shows up in each one of these organizations. So trust in an impulsive organization, trust is placed in whoever is strongest. In a conformist organization, trust shows up in the rules, in order, in the structure, in the hierarchy, hmm. and so forth and so on. So I think these are all different dimensions of the organization. Um, Lauren, I don't know how well I got it. Does that make sense though? I think you nailed it. Yeah, I mean, so, sort of the the frame on the outside, and then moving from in to out. And there's so many ways to approach and navigate. There's a lot of there's a lot of movement in this model. Um, so it would be interesting to think how you might how you might use this. Um, yeah. Well, what's interesting, I guess, is like everything changes, right? And maybe that's you know, they put things in white because they had to, but it's almost like, I guess what I'm taking away from it, right, is like everything looks different as yeah. you move up the spiral. Um, and they're just calling out how, what, 15 things or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious, kind of, Brian, you talked about the first model you loved. We kind of get oh, yeah. a, sp I'm almost thinking like a radar chart here somewhere with the team, uh, where they are and where they want to go. Nice. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, where do you see you are as an organization, and where do you want to uh, where do you want to be? Yeah, you could definitely do an assessment underneath this thing. That would be really cool. Yeah. Um, for me right now, I I I would like to play with it to see um, as we're re envisioning people being more remote. It feels like mm -hmm. we're reinventing an organization and many of these things I see changing, whether you're hybrid, remote or in the office. So I, I would want to look at it a little bit deeper and see how I might use it to uh, talk about that specific issue. Nice. Okay. Anything else on this one before we move on? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. We've only got a couple that were left mm -hmm. <laughs> in the vote. Um, I'll take you to the next one. So situational leadership. Now, those of you that are familiar with situational leadership, I'm just going to tell you, I am going to run roughshod over situational leadership. Okay. This is not the way that Hersey and Blanchard intended it, but it works. So let's give it a shot. So, <laughs> so, uh, the easiest, I, I think the easiest way to look at situational leadership is in, through a lens of on the job training and developing people underneath you. Right. Um, so let's give an example. Let's say that, you know, I'm graphic recording and Casey wants to learn how to graphic record. Okay. 
So uh, level one, quadrant one, I'm going to do it, and Casey's going to watch me do it. So I'm going to tell him, here's exactly how I'm doing this, and this is called directing, okay? Um, level two, now we're doing it together, right? And so he's got about, I don't know, maybe 50% of the knowledge that he needs mm -hmm. to be successful, but we're doing basically a tandem. I'm still right there with him, and I'm offering you know, advice and feedback as we go and, and tweaking as, we, uh, as we're working together. Uh, level three, now Casey's actually doing the graphic recording, mm -hmm. and I'm taking a step back. Now he's got like 80% of the knowledge that he needs in order to be successful. Mm -hmm. And I'm giving him feedback and advice and saying, you know, you probably don't want to do a title entirely in yellow. People probably aren't going to want to, aren't going to be able to read that, right? So I'm just going to tweak him uh, on the on the smaller points. But then by the time that we get to level four, he's got it. It's completely delegated. Uh, he's off and running, but he can always reach back to me as needed. Okay. Now again, if you're familiar with situational leadership, I did it wrong. Um, <laughs> there are totally other dimensions here to that. Um, are around what they call supportive behavior and directive behavior. But functionally, I, I find that that definition that I just used works pretty well with groups to get them to you know, develop skills internally, especially if we've got um, teams that say, I've got a hard time delegating, bam, I'm gonna show them situational leadership. So for example, Rachel mm -hmm. and I are using this same model with a team who has said, we're single points of failure and I don't have anybody to replace me. And if I get hit by a truck, you know, there's no backfill. So this is the model that we've brought to them. Um, somebody who knows situational leadership a lot better than I do will probably completely, you know, explain it differently. And if, if any comments, questions, feel free to weigh in on this one. <laughs> Don't take my word for it, please. Okay, and I think that was actually the last one that got the vote. So we can really go wherever you want to from here. Um, how about you do this? Why don't you just scan? Let me release people so you can scan through the uh, the the mural, okay? And then if you see something that you want to focus on, um, just ask to be followed, and we'll all follow you, and you know we'll do our best to explain it. So what haven't we covered on this one? And apologies, folks. I have to drop off, but super fun to be with you, and thanks for for sharing your wisdom. Okay, big hand for Nevada. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nevada. You're awesome. I'd be curious about exploring the source from Seth Godin down there, control and responsibility. Ooh, can you ask to be followed? Um, let's see. Yes, okay. Okay, so who dropped that one in? Anybody? I dropped that one in. Um, and I also, if you click on the little link, you can open up. It's one of his blog posts that I just, okay. I get his newsletter. And I like it. Uh-oh, another um, Seth Godin fan in the room. Yeah. Um, so the, he calls this the control responsibility matrix, which honestly, I just found it interesting and I had it. And so I dropped it in here. And again, this is another one of those things that I haven't really gotten into. Um, so I really, I'm just going to point you to his blog post. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you. That's good. Put the link in there and we can like, I'd be interested in talking about it, but I haven't really used it. I just found it interesting. The whiner, the victim. Now, Rachel, have you seen any of his TED talks or his other work? Uh, if you haven't, uh, I um, yeah, I've done a couple of his workshops, and I actually okay. saw him speak at a conference. Okay. Good. Can I do one just because it's cool? Well, I think it's cool. Nobody voted on it. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to ask to be followed. You don't have to follow me on this one, but you can. Um, so I got to participate in a survey course a while ago where they did um, really a timeline of leadership theories. And what was I thought was cool about this is you really got to see how our concept of leadership has changed over time. Um, really started in the 1900s with what was called trait theory, that leadership was a trait. Either you got it or you don't. This is the whole idea that you're born with it. And then moving on to Frederick Winslow Taylor, scientific management. Lauren, this is one that I know you know really well from the book, The Management Myth. Um, he talks a lot mm -hmm. about that in 1911. 
about this was about efficiency and where we had like time and motion studies where people would sit there with stopwatches and the idea is is like you know uh humans as pieces of a machine if you think about like the industrialization and then moving on to hawthorne where you've got western Ele electric i think arguably that's really the start of organizational development was the uh what the experiment that happened with western electric Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which we've already talked about, theory X and theory Y, or hygiene theory, hygiene and motivation, which is to say, you know, what really motivates people? Is it just seeking their basic needs, or is it their, mm -hmm. that purpose motive that, like Simon Sinek talks about, for example? Situational leadership, which we've mentioned already, came out in 1985. And then we get into things like participative, uh, participative leadership, um, emotional intelligence, servant leadership. And then in the late 90s, moving into more transformational leadership. I, I just thought that this was kind of a cool timeline of like really what mm -hmm. I think were the driving leadership models of those decades. And I am complete. <laughs> yeah, well done. And I like it how time speeds up as we get later to the right, right? Like, oh, okay. Yeah. Well done. Okay. Oh. Mateo, we didn't do the Johari window. You want to do the Johari window? <laughs> Everyone knows that one by now. Eh, does anybody not know the Johari window? <laughs> it's always good to hear someone else's take on it. Nobody's hands went up. So you're right. Everybody knows it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's just say that I'm constantly battling with this, right? The blind spots, the mask, the unknown. Um, but yeah, now yeah, we're all familiar with this one. There's probably somewhere else that we can go. Okay, well, I, come on. All right, so. <laughs> the, oh, I love it. Lauren's like, wait, 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 let me do this. Hold my beer. <laughs> come on. Do so it. The whole, the, whole, the whole reason for doing the Johari window is, is, is maybe not the whole reason, but how I've seen it applied is, is to, to talk about social capital. And so social capital is the alignment to which the how you perceive yourself is also how others perceive you. And so that's how it's all about expanding that public arena so that your social capital is aligned. And so um, the, my, my professor who teed this up for me for the first time, he, he talks about how you expand the public arena. So how do you expand the public arena from into the blind spot? How do you remove some of your blind spot? Well, what could you do? Your own blind spot? Yes. Take an assessment. Okay, and what would be the purpose of that assessment? Because if you take an assessment, then you are hopefully, if you've got a good bank of questions, that the results of that assessment will shine a light on that blind spot about aspects of your personality that you don't already know. Perfect, and then someone dropped it in there asking for feedback. So that's so that's how you move. So you move it over to into the blind spot by asking for feedback. And then how do you move the, oh, you got it for me. How do you move the public arena and, and reduce the mask, and, and that's, of course, self-disclosure. So, so the purpose of it is how do you make the public bigger? You do that through asking for feedback and then also through self-disclosure. So those are um, the two other important things that are, I think, good well to include. You mean the things written on the, the drawing? <laughs> well, yep. they just, yeah. Yep. Thanks, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Lauren. Well done. <laughs> I got another one I really like. Is that okay? Can I geek out slightly? Yes. All right. All right. I'm going to pull you over here. So this is one. All right. So who here has used the Myers-Briggs at all? Like dabbled in it, taken it? Okay. Yeah. So you've probably seen type tables, right? And, you know, the, the, the classic use of this is, is that after you've got a team that takes the, the Myers-Briggs, they write their names, they identify strengths, weaknesses, you know, opportunities, threats, Carl, amazing. Okay, so you've probably seen a type table before. You may not have seen this thing, which is the best picture that I could find. This is, this is from my own notes. This is a new take on a type table that's called the Magnificent 16, or at least it was new to me when I found it. And what it does is that in, in this case, this lays in the dominant functions. And if you read the original uh, uh, Psychological Types by Carl Jung, he doesn't really talk about the this stuff as much mm -hmm. as he talks about the functions that are going on. And so it, it arranges the types into uh, thinking, intuition, feeling, and then sensing. Um, mm -hmm. And there's kind of a mnemonic there, right? Where like the thinking is the head, so it's up top. The feeling is the heart, so it's a little bit lower. 
Um, the intuition is looking forward, which is what intuition does. It, it's, a, it's a future focus. Sensing is looking towards the past of experience, right? It's going to that filing cabinet of what's in the, in the mind. And then this gray circle around the inside, that draws the line between um, uh, intuition and, I'm sorry, uh, between uh, introversion and extroversion. Um, and so what's cool about this is that if, if you really get into type theory, dominant function is something that's really important, which is the function by which people actually identify themselves. So for mm -hmm. example, using the model, let's take a look at the yellow ones for a, sec for a second. INTJs, INFJs, ENTPs, and ENFPs, for them, intuition is their dominant function. It's the one that's most closely associated with identity. It's how they orient to the world. It's how they see themselves. It's very close to their ego. And so this arrangement of the types is something that you just, you don't get with the type table. And I think it's super cool. Okay. And I am done. I'm late. <laughs> I do want to kind of just acknowledge that it's 7.58 and we're supposed to end at yep, 8. Yep, so maybe yep. we do a little bit of closing. A new checkout? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so maybe one word or phrase in the chat about how the past two hours were for you. And go. Learning. Learning, connecting, gap yeah. filling. Can mm -hmm. I have a can I have a quick closing thought? <laughs> sure. okay. Here's my quick closing thought: is that there's the models, and then there's how you actually present present the models. And and a learning for me is that man, if I don't touch one of these things for a long time, that it's it takes it's it's like it's coming. You have to you kind of have to practice it, and and so observing. Um, it, you know, observing Brian and, and, you know, the ones that you're really familiar with because you just live and breathe them. It's just like, it's just right there. So just a good reminder to choose a few models that you really gravitate towards and practice them so that you feel that place of confidence. Otherwise it can be very intimidating. <laughs> yes, no, that's great. Thank you. All right, um, so I'm gonna go ahead and plug Brian's workshop tomorrow, which I'm gonna also pass back to him to tell you about. Oh, thank you for that. So that is a pilot workshop. Um, that is a, uh, uh, I've been asked to do one um, around hybrid work environments. Um, it's driven uh, primarily off of Mentimeter and I could use all the feedback I could get. It's free and open to anybody who can attend. So thank you for that, Rachel. All right. Okay, thank you everyone for, uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I think maybe we can officially close and then stop the recording and thank you. Thank you. Sure.